Good evening, brother and sister. I greet you tonight in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's good to see you all, and I trust you've come with the same desire that I have. Amen. For more of Him tonight. Amen. So may you feel welcome tonight, and those that are streaming as well, may God bless you wherever you are, and be your strength and portion tonight. Amen. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Let's start our song service at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. Amen. We thank God for that glorious light. Hallelujah of His word. Amen. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Hallelujah! Oh, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there I receive my sight, and now I am happy all the day. One more time. Oh, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there my faith. I receive my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. We'll walk in the light, that beautiful light. Hallelujah. We'll walk in the light, oh beautiful light. Oh, come where the new drops of mercy are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night.
wonderful love tonight. Amen. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty guidance as he starts a new venture at work and going 
independent and asking for the Lord's guidance in his hand in all things. Amen. So we just want to remember our brother in prayer. If you've got a need in your heart, amen, just reach out with an uplifted hand. We know that all things are possible. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. Lord, um, to whom can we turn but unto you? You alone, Lord, have the words of eternal life. Father God, and you have um, our lives in your capable hands. Lord, uh, to lead us and to guide us in all things, Lord, and to lead us into all truth. Father, thank we that thank you once more that we can come together to hear your word once more. Lord, uh, what a privileged people we are, Father that you have called us, Lord, and you've chosen us even in this, in this late hour. Father God, and you are the almighty God who keeps us, Lord, as strong, Lord, and you're keeping your hand upon us. Father, we thank you. Uh, we think of uh, the prayer request our brother Armand brought. Lord, he's se- uh, seeking your guidance, Father, in these important matters. Oh, Lord, may you show your hand unto him, Father. God and Lord, may you bless him and may you keep him, Father God. And Lord, in all that he does, Lord, may his footsteps be ordered of you, Father. May you direct his paths, Lord. May you uh, give him direction, Lord, and uh, leadership in life, Father. And may you, may he uh, faithfully follow your footsteps, Father. Be with us this evening, Lord, even those who are streaming. Lord, um, may you use our brother mightily as he brings the word of life and he breaks the bread of life unto us, Lord. May you anoint him, Father. May you anoint the speaker, the hearer alike. And may you be with us further, we pray. We ask all these mercies in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Hand over. Let's just sing sweet, sweet anointing flowing down to make me clean. Hallelujah. Savior Jesus Christ, great honor and privilege to be back in God's house again this evening and trust that you all came expecting not to hear from man but to hear from him. We thank God for his word and the past services that we've had and our belief for the true believer to him that has an ear, 
They've been hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church, and I believe God is taking us some way. Amen. If we can just be faithful, faithful to His call, faithful to His word, I believe He's duty bound to bless us and to give to us our heart's desires. Amen. We are a needy people tonight, and once more, just to remind you that we are not in a picnic. We're in a battle for every son and daughter of God. We are in a constant battle. It's going to be a constant punch. Sometimes we're going to get bruised. Sometimes you're going to lose an arm. Yeah, just like a real army, when you go out there into battle, you go there expecting anything. But wars and battles are fought for principles. And I believe tonight, true sons and daughters of God stand upon God's word, firm, fighting the good fight of faith. Amen. So whatever the devil brings at us, I believe that God is giving us the grace to be able to overcome every enemy, to overcome every obstacle. And as you've heard, uh, most of you know um, the little tragedy that our brother Gideon had and sister Kathy. But uh, we know the devil is a liar. And we know how his plans are and what the devil tries to do. Um, but we stand firm upon God's word. The scripture says, smite the shepherd, scatter the sheep. And he knows that if he, he knows what he wants to get to. And he knows if he can get that, he can bring a little bit of a disturbance. But he's lost the battle. Amen. All is in control. And we want to thank God for that tonight. And that he was there, I believe he was there at that scene. And all things work together for the good to them that love God. So we want to give God the praise. We thank God for also... Um, our brother Sam Andre being out of hospital, we really appreciate the Lord for that. And uh, like he always says, when you greet him, meet him at the door, say, Brother Sam, how are you doing? He says, I'm going like a Boeing. And I believe he's going like a Boeing tonight. So may the Lord continue to bless him. Um, and uh, tonight, maybe before we go into God's Word, um, I, just, I just feel upon a heart that we should just make a word of prayer and ask the Lord just to undertake for us lead us. These are trying times. And uh, I just pray that God will help us. For those of you that would know, October is also a month for ministers or pastors. Uh, National Pastors Day, one of the days coming up. And we just want to appreciate the Lord for what He has done for our dear brother Gideon. As some might say, Brother Enoch, what move are you trying to pull? But I just feel this from the bottom of my heart. Um, through the lockdown, he was if for, for those that remember, through the lockdown, just before we got to the lockdown, I'm sure if it was just a week before that, I was elected as pastor of the church and we went into a lockdown. And it hasn't been easy for any of you that's been around ministry and that's been part of the family of a minister or being close to that, you understand the strain that comes with it, the dedication that has to come with it. And it's very easy for the onlooker to speak and despise and to judge and to say why this and why not that and I think I could have done this better but we want to thank God for what God has done so far through his life up to this you know up to this age and and this time sister Kathy just being there with him being supportive prophet tells us when God calls a man he calls his wife as well and we just want to appreciate God for him and God places, God places those offices. It's not what man does. I believe it's God that does that. And when we can be faithful to the gifts that God has given to us, then he will bless us as well. Amen. So let us bow our heads tonight for a word of prayer. Our eternal and most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, thanking you, Father, for your goodness, for your grace, and for your mercies towards us. You, the great giver of life, giver of every good gift. We appreciate you for the many best blessings and the benefits that we get from you, Lord. And Father, just to be called your children. Lord, tonight we stand in the shadow of your grace. Lord, having seen how you've been so faithful thus far. And Lord Jesus, we judge you faithful like Sarah did. And Lord, seeing your mighty hand and what you've done for us. Lord, the many healings. Lord, through the this pandemic, Lord, how you've touched many that were sick. And Lord Jesus, we've, we come to where we are now, where restrictions have been, Lord, have been laid down a little. We thank you, O God, for this reprieve that we have, that we could come as your children 
just to sit around your word and to hear from you. Pray in us, Lord Jesus, that you undertake for us in a special way and minister grace to us. This evening, Lord, we just want to make a special prayer for our dear sister Kathy. Lord, the pain that she may be going through, I pray that you undertake for her and just heal her in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. For you said in your word, if we ask anything, believing in your name, it shall be given unto us. Lord, thank you, O God, for your grace and your mercies that saw them through the little incident. And I pray, Father, Lord, that you'll just strengthen them, Lord. Father, we know that the enemy may have meant it for harm and for hurt, but Lord Jesus, I believe it works for the good. And I pray, Father, Lord, that they may see you through all this. May you strengthen them. Bless our dear brother Gideon and strengthen him, Lord, as he carries on, Lord. May, Lord, your light continue to shine upon him, giving him divine guidance to lead the church, Lord, the right way. Father, we thank you for grace thus far. Thank you for the ability, the strength that you've given unto him. Lord, day in, day out, sometimes very little rest, going out to see this one and see that one, and being on his post of duty. May you strengthen him tonight, and Father, may your Holy Spirit undertake for him. Lord and Sister Kathy as well, just be with them, O oh God, and just be their portion, and just refresh them with your spirit tonight, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing for Brother Sam, Andre. Pray that, Lord, you'll be his portion. Thank you for a real soldier of a cross, Lord, how he stood for your truth. And just to see a bubbly, joyful man every time that he comes to church. And, Lord, at such an old age, but holding on to the truth. And, Father, we thank you for a testimony of a true witness tonight. I pray that you'll continue to strengthen him and touch him by your healing grace. Now, won't you be with us now as we take flight into your word? May you undertake for us, Lord, and may your Holy Spirit come and just have his own way. That, Father, the end of it all, we'll be able to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. How we ask these things, believing in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to take your time tonight. I just want to give you a little word of encouragement by God's grace, something that God has placed upon my heart, which is very dear to me, and I trust that you'll allow me to be myself. Um, I'll make a terrible Gideon Retief, I'll make a very bad William Marion Branham, but I think I'll make a perfect Enoch tonight. So I'll just be myself and pray that God will undertake for us. May the Lord richly bless the musicians. Thank you for that wonderful song service that sets us into motion for His Word. Amen. So if we have our Bibles, it's open to 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting from verse, 8, uh, from verse 7 to 8. Thank God for His words that's coming to us, that we are able to perceive and understand the inconceivable. We're able to hear the inaudible, a voice behind the voice like we heard this weekend. Amen. And I believe God is raising our faith up to a place where we can believe for the impossible. Amen. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 to 8, and it reads thus, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto them also that love his appearing. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, and he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. My title tonight is, Keep Your Eyes on the Finish Line. Keep your eyes on the finish line. And to start off a little sermon, you know me by now, I love little stories. And I believe this, the more simple we become, the easier it is for us to understand the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God did not come to us through swelling man's wisdom and through so many complicated things, but it's in simplicity. That is why the kingdom of God is, um, is described or is patterned to a young child. And it's in that simplicity that God begins to reveal Himself. That's why the wise and the prudent of this day and age 
and of, of the time that's gone past, could never get what they were supposed to get. If you want to go anywhere with Christ, you get to come to a place where you become very humble and very simple. And that's how God reveals Himself. Anyway, as we were growing up, apart from the Bible stories that we have in the evening with mom, that was one thing that was a norm. Whether you had exams, or whether you had whatever, you came back from sport, you came back late, you're tired, the first session was with dad. Everybody takes his instruments and you sit around and we begin to play and sing. And that could go on for almost an hour. And you make sure you play your instrument the right way. If you felt you were not doing it the right way, gives it to somebody else, you move around and you kind of rotate. Then you'd have, afterwards, then we'd have our evening prayers. And, you know, as many kids would do today, you kind of get a little bit tired. And my dad, being a preacher, could be a little long-winded. So you sit there and kind of fall asleep. He wakes you up and asks you, what did I just say? What did I just read? And you're almost blank. You don't know what was going on. But what I remember very clearly was after those sessions, it doesn't matter how late it was, if we had a family member over, and we used to have Granny. Granny used to come over now and again, and she would tell us a little, some old folk stories. And all of a sudden, you're so wide awake. You were sleeping during prayer time, but now when it's time for folk stories, you're wide awake. It's midnight. And she would like to tell us stories about the baboon and the monkey. And one that I would like to pick up tonight if you don't mind, is of the rabbits and the tortoise. And she says to us, oh, one day there was a rabbit, and he's such a smart guy, he knows he loves his carrots, he's got his two little sharp front teeth and flappy ears, and he conceived a good idea. And he walked up to one of his friends and he said to Toby the tortoise, he said, look, what? don't you think it would be nice for us to run a race? And Tortoise thought to himself, but why would Rabbit want me to run a race with him when he's, he's robust, he's got the body to do that, he's naturally fast, and I'm not fast at all. But anyway, he said, look, challenge accepted. I will do so. Let's go. So they set a date, and the other animals in the field, and the, the, the farm, all came together. And then they got to the starting point. Everyone, on your marks. And they began to run. So the whistle goes. It's ready for them to go. And they go. Oh, Mr. Rabbit knew he had it. He's robust. His feet are fast. He's, he's experienced. He's used to doing this. So he says, Ah, oh, no, I'm going to win this race. So he runs. He runs ahead. He runs ahead. And he says, oh, I know Tortoise. He's not going to go very far. So instead of getting to, carrying on to the finish line, he stops a bit and he says, I can have a little bit of fun and wait. By the time Tortoise catches up with me, I'll just lap him and gap him and get to the finish line. Anyway, poor Tortoise said, well, look, I may not be much of a runner, but what I want to do is get to the finish line. And slowly but surely, he starts going. Slowly but surely, he starts going. He says, I may not be robust like the rabbit is, but I know I'll get there. My shell may be a little bit heavy, but I carry my shell. It protects me. Let me keep going. And he kept going, slowly but surely. Oh, little rabbit started having some little ch chats with the other animals, chatting up the little rabbit girls, talking to them. How are you doing? Oh, you see, I'm Mr. Macho Man. See how fast I can go. And he forgets what he's supposed to be doing. He forgets that he's in a race. Tortoise is taking such a long time to catch up. He says, oh, well. So as after a while, Tortoise is just about to get up to him. And he starts walking quietly so he can get past him. Now Tortoise is, I mean, Rabbit is finished with all his games. He's tired and he decides, let me take a little nap. And he decides to sit back and he starts relaxing. He says, oh, well, you know, I won this race. You know me. You know me. I'm Rabbit. There's no race that I won't, I won't win. All of a sudden, rabbit, I mean, tortoise had already had quite a gap. And he's gapping and he's going, slowly but surely, little by little, day by day, little by little. Amen. God's changing me, little by little. Amen. And he's walking, he's going, he's looking. But where is he looking to? He's looking to the finish line. 
He wasn't looking at what was around him, but he was looking towards the finish line. By the time that rabbit woke up, he looks around to say, where's my friend? And as he looks up, he sees tortoise is just close to the finish line. Then he says, whoa, I need to run. Now the purpose of this race was for him to get to the finish line. Anyway, he runs, and he runs so fast, the fastest that he could. And as he was just about to get to the finish line, Tortoise had just won the race. Tortoise was slow, but got to the finish line. The story doesn't end there. Then one day, Rabbit is feeling so sad. How could Tortoise beat me? Everybody is talking about how smart Rabbit, I mean, Tortoise is. Ah, oh, Tortoise won the race. Can you believe it? Says, but how could he do that? How could that happen? He's not built for that. Anyway, Rabbit hatches up another idea. And he says, Tortoise, why don't we go for another race? Tortoise says, well, that's fine if you want us to go for another race. I'm happy to do it. We'll do so. And then they begin to go. But now he set the parameters a little different. The finish line is slightly different. And they began to run. And as they began to run, they get to a point where they had to go past a river. The finish line was beyond the river. And as he runs, they run, they run, they run. Rabbit is right in the front like before. Anyway, as, they get, as he gets to the river, he thinks to himself, how am I going to get around this? How am I going to get around this? Now he's worried. Now he walks around. Then he says, okay, I'll pace it. By the time Tortoise comes around and thinks about how to do this, I'll be at the finish line. So he tries to go around and he walks right around the lake. It was such a big lake. A little tortoise just comes. And he's built for it. He might not be swift, he might not be fast, but he's robust. He lives out of water and he can live in water. So he gets to the lake, he starts swimming, he gets right through, and he gets across. Once he gets across, rabbit sees him from afar off. Hey, tortoise, how did you make it to the other side? He says, we're in a race. I got no time to explain. We're in a race. And before he knew it, Tortoise had got to the finish line. The second time that Tortoise is winning the race. He was mad. He was livid. How could this be? He later realized it's not about how fast he is. It's not about his abilities. But the key was to him getting to the finish line in time. Next time he gets to Tortoise again, he says, Look, Tortoise, I understand what happened. You're the champion. But let's have another race. Let's have another race, don't you think? So, well, let's have another race. Tortoise was like, Ha ha, we can certainly have another race, bro. Let's go. They come together again, and they begin to have their race. But this time, this was a different race. They started helping each other through this race. And I don't know how the, hay, the rabbit was able to carry the tortoise, because tortoise should be quite heavy. But this time, as they begin to go through this race, rabbit was carrying tortoise on his back. And when they got to the lake, it was the other way around. Tortoise carried rabbit on his back. And as they got across, they began to walk together. And now the mission is about the finish line. It's not about the race. I want to tell you tonight that the race is not for the swift. It doesn't matter how fast you are. It doesn't matter how much you've started on this Christian race. The point is about you getting to the finish line. I think the message is over. We can go home. <laughs> anyway, so tonight I want us to look at, with this little background, I just want us to get back into Scripture. And I think for the kiddies, they understand this now. And just understand what we are in. God has called us, called us to be sons and daughters of God. And in this race that we've been called into, the Scripture has told us, He says, make your calling and election sure. So we've all been called, called to this race. And it's a race of faith. The Scripture tells us that without faith, we can never please God. And it's mandatory for us when we walk in this Christian walk, 
for us to walk with faith. Let's go back to what faith means. Faith is a substance. Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You can't see it, but you know it's there. You know the wind is there, but you can't see it. You can see its effects, but you can't see it. For you young kids that have played with magnets, you'll know that there's a magnetic field over these two stones. But can you see it? No. You feel it. You see its effects. And that's exactly what faith is like. We see the effects of faith. And you'll notice when you go to Hebrews chapter 11, which is the hall of fame for believers that once stood the test of faith. They ran their race. They stood. And they were heroes right in the end. And as we begin to walk in this race, we begin to realize that we can never do this on our own. You realize that as you come into this race, the scripture says that we should lay aside every weight that so easily besets us. Naturally speaking, when you get into a race, you want to make sure that you're as light as possible. You're not going to carry any baggage with you. Some may say, look, I might get thirsty along the way. I might just need to carry five liters of water. That ain't going to help you. You're going to need to be as light as you can. You'll get water along the way. We are privileged here in South Africa to have the marathon or the Durban marathon that people run, the comrades. And for those of you that have watched it and followed it, you'll notice how they all start. There's many that start in a race. So many. Everybody's excited. I'm running the comrades. And when they start, everyone's flexing their muscles. And that can almost intimidate you. Like, wow, some, big, some guys have been in the gym. They look good. They look like they can make it. Then you've got some people that are so scrawny, skinny, and look like they can't make it. Then you've got the, the slightly, I don't want to use the word fat, but slightly happy ones. And they're all there. And everyone is ready for the race. And when the gun goes, they all start running. There's so much enthusiasm. There's so much excitement. We're in a race. I'm running the comrades. I've made it. And as they begin to run, you'll find some start off very fast. They want to show who they are. I can make this. I can make this. But they forget that there's a finish line. And there's no point in you getting into a race without knowing how far you're going. There's no point in you getting into a race without knowing the actual finish line. You're not there just for entertainment, but you're there to get right to the end. And as you begin to run, you'll notice that some that really make it will tell you that they run that race with endurance. It is never easy. It's not a flowery bed of ease. Your feet get sore. Your muscles get sore. Some tear the hamstrings. Things happen. But the idea is for you to get right to the end. So it's not about a person winning that race as such, although there's a reward to him that wins the race. But the real joy comes when you can complete the race. And we begin to find as they begin to run, many people begin to fall off on the wayside. Some begin to get tired. Some never practiced enough for them to run such a long tr uh, you know, race. Some fall off on the wayside, and some begin to slow down, and some begin to look to the side and begin to look at that one's pace and tries to follow the next person's pace. And they forget that their race is individualistic. It's for you. As much as there's many of you running in that race, it's an individual race. And you have to make sure that you make it till the end. You may be four in the same team, but you're still running on your own. And it's just like us as Gentiles. We are not saved as a nation. We are saved as individuals. And as much as we come together in a gathering, in a building together, um, as sons and daughters of God, as much as we may appreciate one another in fellowship, but at the end of the day, it's an individual walk. And the key and the secret is us getting to the finish line. But how many times do we get distracted with what's happening around us? 
How many times do we get distracted by things that should not be distracting us? We should be running our race with diligence, with fervence, with one thing on our mind is getting right to the finish line. Amen. So, tonight, I want to speak around that and speak about men that were able to keep their eyes on the finish line. Some that failed to do that because of distractions that come their way. Just before the pandemic, it seemed like we were so many and so big. Excuse me for saying this. But as the pandemic starts, a lockdown starts, we're obviously in a race. But as we go on, our fervence for the Lord begins to melt down. And many took occasion to be busy with the wrong things. And their focus and their mind on what they're supposed to do drifted away. Many have fallen aside and started falling after strange gods. Many have fallen aside, fallen the wayside, and started believing different things. Some have got themselves tangled up in relationships and things that they should have never ever got themselves into. You would suspect that during the lockdown, everybody's safe in their homes, not going anywhere. But there's some that took occasion to even break the law. He had called themselves Christians and indulged in things that they should not be doing. They got themselves so messed up that when it's time to come back and everything seems to be back to normal, let's come back and worship, it's so difficult. I got myself stuck in a snare. You don't know what to do, you don't know where to go. And you feel it's better for me to stay back and just be me. And you forgot that you got into this race not to compete with anybody else, but for you to look at the finish line. And you'll notice towards the end of this service that our finish line is actually Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking at. That's the finish line. If your finish line is anything else besides that, then you got it wrong. If anything else that you have in your mind, then you're in the wrong race. Our finish line is Jesus Christ. We just read here in Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible is telling us, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus himself had to despise the shame. He recognized the race that he was running. He recognized his purpose and what he was called for. He recognized that there was nobody that was like him. He was not in the race to try and be like somebody else. He was not in the race to try and run his race at the pace of somebody else. He was his own pace setter. And he knew that he could only do what the Father showed him to do. The scripture says, I do nothing until the Father shows me. So he waited for that notion. He waited to be led of the Spirit of God. And as children of God, we are motivated by only one thing. And that is by His Spirit. We are born into this world, but we are not of this world. We cannot conform to the things of this world. We cannot be changed into the things of this world. But we are conformed into the image of Christ Jesus. And that's our hope. That's our desire. That's what we long to be. We only want to be like Jesus. But what happens in the interim? We have a syndrome which I personally call the comparison syndrome. The church is busy looking at somebody else. The believer is looking at somebody else trying to be like the next person. I want to tell you tonight that when God created you, He created you in such a unique way. There's nobody else on the face of the earth that's like you. I don't care how many other types of Enochs will try and be on the scene. There will only be one Enoch. There will only be one that looks like me. There will only be one with a nose like me. They may look similar, but they will never be like me. There is nobody that will be able to laugh the way I do. It, I'll be the only one that can do that. So, I just want to let you know, put a disclaimer, your mold has been broken, God finished and done with it, copyright on it, and there is nobody that will be like you. So why do we waste our time trying to be like somebody else? God has given you a full life, life to live, 
and in this life to live, there are certain things that must happen. Certain things that God is going to allow to happen to you. But in so doing, your eye is fixed on the price. Your eye is fixed right on the finish line. Not about what's happening now. We may go through trials. Brother Gideon and Sister Kathy just went through their crash. That's not the time to stop. That's the time to look at the finish line. The devil tries to put things at us and throw things to us to slow us down. But we will not stop. Have you noticed many times as you begin to run in the race, you've got people that watch on the sides and some will be encouraging you. Some will criticize you and tell you, come on, run faster. Come on, put some more oomph. Some are encouraging you, but some will actually discourage you. You look at some that will maybe whisk past you and go so quick and go so fast. Some will come and say, oh, brother, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I spoke in tongues. You know, I'm not dead. I'm not dead wood. I got the spirit. I got the power. And you look and you see this man looks so, so bubbly. They're so, so on fire, so noisy. Nothing wrong with that. But you've got to watch. If his eye is not on the finish line, there's a problem. He's running the wrong race. You begin to see and look at yourself and see how God has called you. Don't compare yourself with anybody else. You compare yourself with the scripture. Because we are being conformed into this perfect image. Amen. If I may run ahead of myself, how easy is it every morning in this world that we live in? The first thing that happens before you wake up, it's your phone. Quick gadget, quick access. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Begins to look. Go to his social media to try and see who's trending. What's happening? Who's who? Who can I be like? What's the new style? And sometimes we feel left out. Sometimes we feel we're not adequate enough. If I don't have this kind of hairstyle, then I'm not in with them. If I don't wear this kind of pants, then I'm, I'm not in with them. If, if I don't join this certain group, then I'm not with them. But why don't we go back to the scripture? Go back to the word. Mirror, mirror, who's the fairest of them all? The scripture has told us that he is the fairest of 10,000. He is the lily of the valley. He is the root and offspring of David. Amen. And that's what we desire to be because we are a part of him. You and me are a part of him as much as we may be so different. Our faces and everything may look different, but we were made in his image. We are part of him and our desire is to be like him. And now getting back to comparison, you cannot go try and fight and live your life comparing yourself with others, and comparing yourself with this and comparing yourself with that until you become a failure. You get to a point where you don't even live your own life because you've, half your life you've been trying to live somebody else. Now let's go to scripture and begin to find where there was this problem. We begin to see, I want to pick up the example of Little David, David a shepherd boy, probably all stinky, a shepherd would smell like his sheep, always there, looking after his flock, doing what he could do. And at the same time, somebody had been king in Israel, and that was Saul. And the Bible tells us that Saul was a handsome man. Oh boy, Saul was handsome. He stood way above everybody else. He had the muscles. He was good looking. And I tell you, if the Bible says that Saul was handsome, nobody's going to tell you that he was ugly. If the Bible says you're handsome, you're handsome. He was a handsome man. And everybody loved him. He was, he was like the right fit. People's desire. Israel come to a point where they wanted a king. Say, we want to be like the nations. We just want to be like everybody else. Give us a king. Anyway, there comes Saul. Saul has been prepared for such a time as that time. He's there leading the nation, and things are going well. He fights quite a few battles. He wins those battles, and he's the man. But in the background, there's a lot of little boy that's coming up, anointed with the Spirit of God. He just loves the Lord, so in touch with nature, so simple, so humble. Nobody knows him. Nobody knows his name. Nobody cares about him. He's got big brothers out there that's part of the army. And his job is to 
kind of takes some sammies and little sandwiches for his brothers, and he does that faithfully. Goes and gives them, goes and tends to his animals. And God starts training him at a very young age, speaking to him, working with him through different experiences. And I want to tell you, experience is the best teacher. And I wonder why the prophet tells us that you should not try to attempt to preach or do things like that without having a backside experience of the desert. And I believe that every true son of God comes through that experience. Where they come to meet up with God, that experience is better than what anyone can give you. You cannot buy it. It's something that you hold so dear. When you put you through your resume for work, you prove that I've got experience. I've had 10 years doing this. That's much more than what anything else can say. I can do the job. I've been there. I know the technicalities. I know the ins and outs. So you put me in any situation, I should be able to handle it. I've been through it. Anyway, we begin to see how David comes up. He kills the bear. He kills the lion. So he's got some fair amount of experience of fighting the enemy with his sheep. But one day, he's, as he does his normal routine and goes to see his brothers, it was a bit of a different day. And he sees them all gathered, all different, and looking all funny. And what's happening here? He says, hey, bros, I brought you your food. What's happening? Like, hey, there's, there's a war happening here. There's, 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 there's this man called um, Goliath. That is threatening to kill us. And we don't know what to do. And David's probably like, but what's happening to King Saul? I mean, he's, he's fought many battles. He's, he's done the job. He says, oh no, he's, he's threatened very hard. He's threatened very, very hard. We don't know what we're going to do. Anyway, David begins to look. He looks around and he sees his brothers defeated. He sees everything seems to be going wrong. And he's had an experience out there. And the faith starts rising up within him. David was not really looking at what was around him. He, nobody knew him. He was a simple man. But he was looking at the finish line. He was looking at him who was able to keep him from falling. He was looking at him who had inspired him through the years and blessed him to fight the enemy. And he says to himself, this is unheard of. We are the children of Israel. This, this is unheard of. How can somebody like that speak and say such horrible words to the army of God? I will fight this. And he gets up there, a little bitty fellow. I can imagine his shoes must have been a little stinky. Gets out there and his brother's like, hey, what, what do you think you're doing here? So like, give me a chance. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. As he gets there, he says, okay, well, fine. This man is threatened. Nobody's ready to go out. Well, David, try some of this armor. Try some of Saul's armor and see if it fits you. See if it works for you. Gets it on. He puts it on. It was so heavy. He puts on, this, try to get the theology on him. DD, LLD, what have you. And it was, just, it was just too complicated for him. He says, no, no, I haven't had experience with this. I need to do what I understand. I need to allow God to use me in His own way, the way God has made me. And I want to encourage you tonight that the best person that you can ever be is to be yourself. Be yourself, but with an endurance to be like Jesus. Don't try to be like anybody else. God has made us different for a specific reason. Some are quiet. Some are loud. Some seem to be a little noisy. But that's God's bouquet. And many times we stumble over those things because we don't recognize the uniqueness that God has placed within us. That's how God has made us. But deep inside there's a love for God. There's a desire for the truth. And any time that you try to be like somebody else, you will fail. You will fail bitterly. But when you become who God has made you, you will be an overcomer. The scripture tells us that. You will be an overcomer if you just be who you are. Anyway, we begin to see David. He begins to look and he says, How can you let this uncircumcised Philistine... Oh, I, like, I just love that language, man. How can you allow this uncircumcised Philistine curse the army of God? And he walked out there with his sling and he said, You come to me with sword and shield, 
But I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And it was just him. He had no armor. He just had that slingshot. And in God's power, in God's might, David being David, he had thrown away everything that he had got from Saul. And he got out there and he slew the enemy. He slew Goliath. And Goliath at that time, being a big man, represented a big army. Thousands of armies. He says, if I, if I conquer you and I can kill one of you, I'll get all of you on my side. But anyway, David prophesied before he killed Goliath. He said, I will feed your head to the birds. <laughs> Talk about faith. Talk about believing something before it happens. He says, I will feed your, he your head to the birds. <laughs> and Goliath looks at him and says, are you serious? You think you can do it, you little old bitty fellow? He says, well, look, <laughs> I know God in the power of his resurrection. He's done it before. He's helped me. I'm not afraid. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Let the enemy do what he wants to do. It ain't going to shake me. Let the trials come. Let the storm winds rise. It ain't going to shake me. I know the God that was with me will be with me. That situation, you know, it sounds like a ju juvenile story. But if you really begin to think, it must have been quite a day. Scary. Recognizing a man with six fingers and six toes. Standing high, threatening to kill you. Anyway, he gets up there, he kills Goliath. Now I want you to watch something. After Goliath is dead, there's a jubilation. This is a poor little fellow that has done great things. He's not known. And forgive me, I'm just going to be me again. I can imagine a guy that wasn't even known. All of a sudden, ho oh, ho. David's name is trending. Guess who killed Goliath? David. Social media, the newspaper had the headlines. David the warrior. He's killed Goliath. And everyone was like, wow, where, where did this boy come from? Whose son is he? What's happening? And, and before then, you know, before this, before this happened, I can imagine, before he even killed Goliath, I could imagine how he may have felt. And maybe the encouragement that he must have got from his brothers, knowing that they were in such a situation. And I can almost hear probably one of David's brothers, Abinadab, saying to him, Hey, Dave, you know what? This sounds, this sounds really difficult to do, but please, man, I don't know how we'll be able to explain this to Dad if you go and take such a challenge. And he says, Well, no, look, I will, I will do it. I will do it. And he says, Hey, but you know, I, I, I hear this, you know, with the army, there's perks that come with the army. I could imagine maybe, you know, if, if you win the battle, you might just get the king's daughter, you know? And prob probably David came to his senses and said, What? Are you serious? Hold my heart, Abinadab. Let me get to the job. Got to the job, he did his job. And once he's finished, he goes on playing his harp. He was skillful. Remember the Bible tells us that David was skillful on the harp. God had given him that gift. He starts giving praises to God for the victories that he had won. And how many times do we actually praise God for the victories that we have won? This generation is a generation that unsatisfied. Amen. A generation that, you know, never you know, appreciates anything. So many things are done for you, you don't care. Young kids, food is put on the table, transport is given for you to go to school, everything is done for you, but you don't appreciate. You want more. You want to be like Billy across the road. You look at somebody else, somebody's dad bought, oh, I'll buy you a little car. He says, well, look, daddy says, you drive my car. Daddy's car might not be as, you know, smart and lovely like the other person's car. But he's given you the opportunity to drive a car. And then you become so ungrateful and say, well, look, they have a car. Why don't I have one? And I must drive this old butter little car. And that's just how the, our generation is, very ungrateful. May God help us tonight and help us to look, not at the things around us. Look at what God has set for us. Look at the finish, finish line. Amen. So we begin to see when this happens, the women, the scripture tells us, in a playful mode begin to rejoice. And they began to sing. They say, whoa, <laughs> Saul killed his thousands. David his ten thousands. And they began to sing along and began to sing along. 
But does David know what's happening? He's simple. He, he doesn't worry about what people are saying. That, that was not where his focus was. His focus was to make sure that Goliath was down. And his purpose was to move on. Lord, what more do you have for me? What do you want to do in my little life? He's going on. He's playing his harp. He's enjoying himself. And his brothers must be in awe. What has happened to this little man? How did he manage to do this? But we begin to see handsome Saul. He started off his race. He was doing well. He was focused. He was running straight. And even in a normal race, if you're going to run, looking around at the sides, run looking around at the sides, you know you're going to trip and you're going to fall. You've got to be focused. You've got to be determined. You've got to run with endurance. But we see Saul that has started off well with many battles, seems to be going well. He gets to a point where he starts looking at David. And that was one of his greatest mistakes when he started comparing himself to David. Everything was fine until a third party mentioned something. And he said, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Did David kill ten thousands? When you read it in the text, he only killed Goliath. So in my opinion, that was just an expression. They're happy. They're happy that Goliath is dead. It's a figurative expression. We are happy Goliath is dead. But Saul takes it to heart and begins to compare himself to a little bitty fellow that comes from the fields, that's stinking, that's not even as handsome as he is, that looks so ugly, probably, and he begins to compare himself. And I want to tell you something tonight. That comparison in your life will always overshadow and will deem the calling of God on your life. Whatever God has set for you, if you begin to compare yourself with somebody else, you will never meet your goal. You will never fulfill your purpose. I would ask you tonight, how many that is laying in the graveyard this evening may have lived a life that was unfulfilled? May have lived a life that did not fulfill its purpose. So help us God tonight. May God help each and every one of us to begin to take self-introspection and begin to look at our lives and say, Lord, what is my purpose? What is this race that you have set for me? What would you have me do? What is it that you have ordained for me? It ain't good for me trying to be like the next person. It ain't good for me to imitate somebody else. Part of my life will be stolen away from me without fulfilling what I should. So we begin to see that that thing became a canker worm. It became a cancer. And from then on, Saul was after David. And that's exactly what is happening amongst us. We begin to compare out each other with the ministry. He doesn't preach the unfolding word. Oh, he's still very low, low class. He doesn't preach. He doesn't preach the real revealed word. He doesn't get to the meat. And you forget that God has got a five-fold ministry. And each person is running their race as God has called them. And I've come to a point where I said to myself, there ain't no point in me trying to be like anybody else. Because I will be miserable. After you have tried to imitate the next person, you become miserable. And this is where many friendships are broken. You compare yourself to the other. I'm a better Christian. I understand this better. I know how to do this better than he does. I don't see it that way. The way I read it and the way I see what Brother Branham is saying, he's saying this there. So if you don't see it the way I see it, then you're not part of my clique. And people begin to fight over trivial things. And we begin to have such an animosity amongst each other. We may try to be godly. We may try to be Christian. Oh, let's have a little outing together. Let's have a little dinner together. And you watch how awkward the feeling is. This one has got a hard nature. And that one has got a hard nature. And you call yourselves children of God. Oh, we call ourselves the children of God. And something good is happening amongst us. Oh, we've got a revival happening in us. God is revealing this and revealing that. If God is really revealing His Word to you, it will make you overcome your differences. 
But you watch the tension that begins to come between us is because of that comparison. Instead of us appreciating what God has done for us and what He has done for the next person, instead of cheering your brother on in the race that he's going on, we begin to despise and discourage. And one thing that you can never deceive is you can never deceive yourself. You can deceive somebody else, but you can never deceive yourself. If you don't truly love somebody, you cannot deceive yourself. When you come into the presence of that person, there's something in you that just begins to churn. And you wonder why. It's, of course, because of comparison. May God help us that we may stop the comparison game and begin to follow the route and the line that God has called us for. I believe God is calling each... He's call, I believe we can all testify tonight that God has put a special calling on each and every one of our lives. And you're not here, like I always say, you're not here by mistake. You're here for a specific reason. And God has ordained you for that specific reason. And unless you find that reason, which that reason is us coming to a point where we become like Him, come into His image, brought into this world to be tested and tried, to prove who we are. We're ambassadors. So why should we be caught up with the things of the world? You'll find God will bless a brother with a little car. You're probably driving a little Tata. It's taken him from point A to B. But then he looks at his brother and sees his brother is driving. Let me not get myself into trouble. Driving a Maserati. And he thinks to himself, Lord, I'm also your child. I even came to the message before that brother. I got the unfolding of this word before he got it. And now you're blessing him. You're blessing him with all oh, so many good things. What about me? And we spend our time doing that in the church. What about me? What about me? What about me? And you forget that he's running his own race. And many times you find out that somebody, the person that's got to where they've got to, they've had to overcome so many obstacles. Many times it's not easy. Have a sit, sit down with somebody that you may think is successful in life. Has things going well for them and ask them, how have things been for you? And they'll tell you about the amount of difficulties that they've had to go through. Certain obstacles. But remember that the scripture tells us that riches are a chance. So we'll all not be rich. That's not our spiritual blessing. That's not why we're here on earth. It's not for us to have big houses or have big cars. Have the best suits. Have so many change of clothes. Show off to one another. No. We're called to be like Jesus. And if I can find a man that can be more like Jesus, what a joy that brings to my heart. That's our desire. Each morning that we wake up, that is why it's imperative for us to get up, open our Bibles and begin to read. And when we begin to look into God's mirror, we begin to find our reflection in there. Amen. The more you become, look into it, the more you become that. Amen. See, my watch is not working in the back there. Anyway, so the, 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 the issue of comparison will actually blind you from the calling that God has placed upon your life. So may God help us tonight that we may look at things in a different way. Now, I want us to go move a little from David. And let's look at another man that was called of God. A tool in God's hand. A tool of vengeance. You know, I love the way God does things. I, I love the way he, he plans his things. This man was just built for vengeance. This man called Samson, born under Nazarene vow, never to cut his hair. He's brought up in godly ways. He's taught what to do and what not to do and how to do it. It wasn't so much maybe of the do's and don'ts, but it was about him being told about who he is. And he had that in his mind. And he knew his call. He knew who he was. He was a, naughty, a very naughty fellow. At times when he gets upset, he could go and lift up those gates and just do very interesting things. But we see, as he begins to carry on, knowing the call of God upon his life, what God has called him for, what he's ordained for, he knows who he is. And he's got the blessing of God. 
Now look at, da at David. David had had all these blessings, but it never blinded his eyes to the one that blessed him. But look at Samson. His gift, his strength, his long hair. I, I, I suppose he really was quite a hunk too. And he had been told, don't go to, don't join yourself up with this other nation. He knew what he was supposed to do and what he was not supposed to do. He knew who the enemies of God were. But as he began to move on, he began to trust in his strength, and he forgot that it was about God. He forgot that he had a Nazarene vow. And that was not about him. It was about God. He begins to flirt with the world. He begins to mess around with the wrong crowd. He begins to do things that he's not supposed to do. But he still got the anointing on him. Brother Brown says that they will walk into church. They will come to church and still continue in their things. As long as they can be said they are part of such and such a group. Now I want to submit, you, submit to you tonight that your coming to church does not make you a better Christian than the drunkard out there. Your coming to church is an expression of what God has done on the inside. And I have a problem with somebody that will sit back from church and say, I won't go to church, I know what God has done for me. Where is the expression? Because when there's something that's happening on the inside, it's going to bring you to people that's like-minded. Because that's, that's the nature of God. That's who He is. There's a uniting that is happening. A night, uniting amongst God's children. I'm not saying go into a denomination or join a certain group of people. I'm talking about where you express yourself. Where you express your worship. A place where you come and you identify with. Amen? We know, as the scripture tells us, Brother Bram tells us, his commission, and what he was told, he says, is John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming of Christ. You shall be sent. Your ministry will be to forerun the second coming of Christ. John the Baptist was a Baptist. Brother Branham, coming from a Baptist background, those two always had to run parallel in their types. And you begin to see how John the Baptist, at his time, began to speak against sin. He spoke against the wrong of the day. But what was, he to, what was he doing? He was preparing a way for the Lamb of God. He was not mistaken about his calling. He knew who he was. He knew what his commission was. He knew what his purpose was. And as he does that, he sees the king. And the king is with somebody that he's not supposed to be with. And he went up to her and says, it's not lawful for you to have her. He did not keep quiet. Away with these nice Christians. I don't want to hurt their feelings. Truth is truth. Whether it's Brother Enoch making the mistake or doing the wrong, or somebody else, truth is truth. If Brother Enoch is in the wrong, then Brother Enoch has to come right with God. And remember, this, the bride of Jesus is not going to go through any other tribulation. We're not. We're going to be perfected here on this earth. And it's through the washing of the waters of the Word. So we're washed by the Word. And that Word, as it comes forth, it washes us. It cleanses us. It brings us to where we ought to be. Now you watch Samson as he began to mess around and began to flirt with the world. He's got his long hair. The anointing is there. He goes out, he's doing mighty things, he's showing his power. And, you know, everybody can say the power of God is on this guy. But what does he have hanging around him? He's got a little Delilah. And how many of these little Delilahs are we keeping around us? How many Delilahs are we keeping around us? That take us away from the true promise of God's word. I can almost hear somebody saying, he ain't really preaching much. He's preaching from the book of life. 
Brother Branham in the message, God of this evil age, he says that they have taken on the mark of the beast without even knowing it. He says they say the days of miracles are past. They will despise and they will speak evil. And may God help us. This is a generation where we've got so much freedom to say what we want. And I want to say this from the bottom of my heart. Me growing up with the message does not mean that I know anything better than anyone. But I think I've been around enough to know that God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter when you started the race. If you're not going to pull through right to the end, you're wasting your time. You've got to get right with God. It doesn't matter what position you hold. Sometimes we get so consumed by titles. We get so consumed by who we are. I'm deacon so and so. I'm minister so and so. I need to be given a chance. I need to be this. I need to be that. My ministry is this. My... You keep in your lane. You look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your life. You just be who you are and you'll be the best person. Wouldn't it be a joy when you come to the end of your life, when you look back and you say, I've run the race, I've fought a good fight, amen, and I've kept the faith. How many keep the faith today? Samson lost his faith. He began to tell his secret to the wrong person. How can light and darkness fellowship together? Impossible. And when you begin to do that, you guarantee that you're going to get into trouble. And it's said to say that most of us, as religious as we may look, we're in trouble. I don't need to say what we get into. I don't need to point out the things that so easily beset us. We are humans. We're in this fleshly realm, and we're prone to make mistakes. We're prone to fall. We're prone to fail. But I believe that as a child of God, there is an anchor that holds us and brings us to where we ought to be. The disciples at one time were told by Jesus, and he said to them, let us go on to the other side. If only they had listened to just that one statement. Because when God speaks, it's perfect. God never makes a mistake. When He speaks, His word is forever settled in heaven and on earth. And He says, it's done, it's done. So if He says we're going to get to the other side, they should have been, after walking with Him for so long, and seeing the miracles and everything that He had done, they would have just believed that. We're going on to the other side. And as they begin to go and travel, a big storm comes. And they get afraid. And Jesus is in the lower deck and he's just taking a little nap. Jesus, the pure rest, taking a nap. And they forgot who they had in the boat with them. Many times we forget who's in the boat with us. The storms of life come our way. And I understand that life can be so difficult at times. We've been through a real rough time. We've all lost our loved ones that would have loved to be here. Some have got sick. Some have lost their jobs. Some relationships have been strained because of financial difficulties. Husbands and wives scratching each other because they're comparing each other. Brothers and sisters fighting. You imagine a husband coming back home the wife has been working the whole day to try and make the best meal possible. Comes and sits at the table. Begins to eat. And he's just about to finish. Takes his handkerchief and begins to wipe his mouth. That was lovely. But instead of complimenting his wife, he say, mm, my mama never used to make a meat like that. See how that sparks a rage in the wife that has worked so hard the whole day. Why don't you get your mama to make that meat for you then? Don't waste my time. And out of something so simple, 
It was a comparison that was put. And it sparks a war. Young children are being born into homes where father and mother fight constantly day and night. They are born with such a fear that that is being imprinted in their DNA. The next generation that's going to come is going to be fearful. It's going to be filled with so much fear. Not confident enough to do anything. And we're guilty of that tonight. May God help us. Not to look at the things around us, but to look to the finish line. God has made husband and wife and placed you, which I believe is a position in Christ, to raise up those children in the fear and admonition of the Lord Jesus. They ain't your kids. As much as you may claim that they have your natural DNA, but they're not yours. God has borrowed them to you. He put a soul in them, and He's the one that gave life. Nobody can give life. Only God does that. So we begin to see how Samson begins to mess himself up with Delilah. And he gives his secret away. His hair is cut. And while he's sleeping and he's in the wrong place, the enemy begins to plan things against him. And see what happens. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He gets up and he thinks he can get up like old, like old times. I'll just be who I am like old times. I'll break the chains. I'll do what I can. I've got the anointing. And he forgets that the anointing has left him. He tries to move. He feels weak. Oh Lord, what's happening? Samson, where are you? Where are you, Samson? You were supposed to be looking at the finish line. God calls you to be a tool of instrument of vengeance towards the enemy. But it looks like the picture has been turned upside down. Now what? Oh, the enemy had a field trip with him. Oh, Delilah was so happy. That little painted face Jezebel that looked like she loved him began to do things to him. He went through pain. His eyes were gobbled out and he lost his sight. He was bitten. Things were not nice for him. But in his lowest ebb, he began to look and say, Lord, I need your grace. How dumb could I have been to listen to the lie of the devil? How dumb could I have been to try and follow the entertainment of the world? How dumb could I have been to try and compare myself with the Philistines? Lord, you made me so unique. I'm so different from the rest of them. What was I trying to do? God has made you so unique. He's made you so different to the rest of the world. Why try and be like somebody else? He says there, and the Philistines began to enjoy. They began to have a party to celebrate the great victory that they had won. Samson had been a terror. And as they begin to have fun and enjoy themselves and drink, and they started making spot of him, and the world will make spot of you. They know what you once claimed. They know who you are. Are you not that one that claimed to be a Christian? What happened? You seem to be a professional in the things that we do, better than we do. Isn't that interesting? Find somebody when they begin to backslide and go away. They become the pros in anything. And you wonder when they learn the arts. But it's just the enemy's way of destroying what God has placed in there. But I come here tonight to tell you that there is a way out. If the devil had messed around with you and it got you comparing yourself with somebody else, got you messed up. Look, we've got so many examples. We could go on the whole night tonight, but I don't want to take you long. I'm coming to an end. I trust that this is going to help somebody. It might not help everyone. Maybe one person. Sometimes when Bradham would preach a message and in his heart, just looking for that one soul to come. You may be very high level, unfolding words. This might be very low for you. But there's somebody, 
just ran the race. They started in the race, and somehow they've had a hamstring or something go wrong. And they've slowed down on their pace. And they've got a desire to get to the finish line. My encouragement for you tonight is that there is a way out. Samson, in his great distress, in the way that he was, it wasn't looking good, it wasn't in good shape. They're making spot of him. But he began to remember who he was. And as he began to ponder on the Lord and think on the things of the Lord and think on his ways, that hair begin, began to grow. Remember, he had a covenant. A covenant is not a promise. A covenant cannot be broken. God had that covenant with him. And as long as he kept that Nazarene vow, he would have that strength. God has a covenant with you. And he knew you before the foundation of the world. He wanted you to be an expression of who he was. Not an expression of somebody else. And all he's waiting for and what he's looking for is where you can look into the mirror and say, Mama, that's me. He's looking for that. That identification. Where you can walk in strength. Where you can walk in power. Where the things of this world don't bother you. I was so inspired one of these days we were standing out there. Just a simple discussion, simple fellowship. And one brother said to me, said to us, I don't remember when I got upset. I don't remember when I last got upset. I said, wow, that's a virtue. I don't remember when I last got upset. Because I know that I, do, I cannot control what happens. I cannot control. So I give it back to God. I don't stress for nothing. He's too blessed to be stressed, as they say it. And as a child of God, we've got to come to that place. If you're looking towards the finish line, you not worry about controlling the things that are around you. You not worry about what this one is saying and what that one is saying. Someone will tell you, I don't see it that way. Haven't you often heard, when we started in the message, we were like this. And when we started, this is what we used to do. Well, what happened? What happened? If you started off like that, what happened? Why are you asking me? You do it. You walk, the li- you walk the line. You walk the rope. It's a tight rope. You walk it. You've often heard the story of the bridge and the bicycles and them that were riding. Everybody that started looking down or what was around them would fall. But the one that looked towards the finish line made it right through. And that's exactly what God wants to do with us, with the children of Israel. They had a finish line. But when they failed to look towards that promise, they died in the wilderness. Anyway, we begin to see how Samson began to come back to his senses. And he began to pray. And he started getting inspired. And he spoke to the lad that was leading him around. And he says, take me to the pillars of this building. He had had enough of the music. He had had enough of the mocking. Haven't you had enough of the mocking of the world? Haven't you had enough of being condemned by the things that so easily beset you? You know what I find very strange? We claim that we've got the unfolding word, and yet we've got dozens of people dying in the church. Our church is a fool. We're big. We're streaming. We've got so many numbers of people watching us all over the place. But yet there's no life. God help us tonight. It's not about the numbers. It's not about how smart you are. It's not about what you know. It's do you know Him? Here's the finish line. And if we can strive to know Him, it will make us so humble. It will make us loved and lovable. It will make us surrender ourselves wholeheartedly. We'll not be selfish. When something is done wrong against us, we're able to forgive. We'll not live our lives in competition with anybody else. We'll say, Lord... Lead me. Give me the strength. Now we see Samson just gets there and says, lead me to the pillars. Lead me to the pillars of this building. As he began to get there, he began to feel them. He touches his hair. He feels that hair. He says, Lord, this is the covenant that you have with me. He said, Lord, just once more. Once more, Lord. I know I'm in a terrible shape. 
But let me die with my enemies. Let me die with my enemies tonight. I know I've messed up. I know I've gone the wrong way. I know I've done what I shouldn't be doing. But give me grace just once more. One more time, Lord. Forgive me and try me one more time. And he started feeling the power come back. And I would like to type it. This is Enoch now typing this. Those two pillars. It's your Bible, the Old and New Testaments. And he began to feel that. And say, Lord, let this word, let this word be my judge. Let this word atone for me. Puts his hands there and he begins to move those pillars. And he began to, in the meantime, the Philistines are having a time of their life. They're enjoying themselves. They don't know what's about to happen. Mass destruction is just about to happen. And as he begins to have faith and stand there, he pushes through those walls and that building came tumbling down. He says, Lord, let me die with my enemies. Isn't that your prayer tonight? Say, Lord, let me die with my enemies. I don't want to live a miserable life. I don't want to live a life where I compare myself with so many people. I want to get to the finish line. Look at Enoch of old. That's my desire. He walked with God until he received a good report. He walked with God until he was not. Why? He had one thing on his mind. It was the finish line. And look how God begins to unveil himself to him. And when you have that on your mind, see how God begins to reveal his word to you, not upon some man's understanding. Sometimes we feel so comfortable when I can understand things the way this brother sees things. But it's us understanding how God sees it. And God wants us to come to a full understanding of who he is. And then thereby we're able to live that way. There's a common saying that says that if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within you and look around you, you're going to be so depressed. But if you look to God, you'll have such a rest. You'll feel such a comfort. You'll feel such a hope. Thank God for men, even amongst us, that we can look back that God has taken home to be with Him. They've run their race. They ran it diligently. You may have your questions about what happened, what the tragedy was, and what could have happened. But it was God's time. They had run their race. And if we can only accept that, we will be a happy people. You're so worried. Sometimes we get worried about what has happened in the past, and we keep holding on to that. And we get ourselves into such a nervous state that we cannot move on. Don't do that to yourself. Your race is an individual race. You run the race with faith. You run the race with endurance. You run the race with diligence. Knowing that Him that has started the work will complete it. Remember, it's not about your strength. It's what He does in you. So you say, Lord, this whom I, person I'm grieving over, if you could manifest yourself through them in such a way, help me to also run my race that I may have a testimony like they do have. Wouldn't that be your desire? Because that is God work that would have worked in that person. And when, your time, when our time is over, let's be frank about it, when the time is over, God takes us home. If his if coming delays, then that's it. Some wouldn't want to come to church. Some don't want to have nothing to do with church. But I want to tell you something that you may not like to hear tonight. You will come to church. But unfortunately, it will be too late. There won't be any time for you to repent. You can't move. You can't say anything. It's done. And while we still have the opportunity to make men's and make rights, live the right way, I'm not preaching to condemn you tonight. I'm not preaching to condemn anyone. I'm not smarter than anyone, but I feel this in my heart. We need to get to a place where, with the revelation of the word that God is giving to us, it's supposed to be taking us to higher places, to higher grounds, where we just say, Lord, manifest more and more of yourself in me. That opening of those seals was Christ. As you begin to open up that word and see, you just see Christ. You see Christ everywhere you look. 
Don't get yourself disappointed by the things that's happening around you. Can't you see that's just the tool of the enemy to take you away from your purpose and what you're really supposed to do? Brother Bram talks about Napoleon and how he was so miserable at the end. Somebody that had conquered the world. Smart guy and everything. But he forgot that it was not about him. It was about God. May God help us tonight. Keep us in a place where we'll be able to walk and ride through the storms. Whatever problem you may be going through tonight, it may be a financial problem, and you don't know, Lord, how am I going to go past this? Some get themselves entangled up in things that they should not because they're trying to run up with the pace of life. Just say, Lord, I lay this to you. You gave me the life, and you take care of me. And when you become faithful and you rest in Him, who is Christ? He's at rest. When you rest in Him, He begins to make everything beautiful. When he, when he had created everything and He came to a rest, He looked at everything and said, this is good. And when we can rest through our trials, through what happens, and as a child of God, you're going to go through rough times, things that will take the hide off you, it's going to be painful. Sometimes you're going to look for friends and there's no friends. Say, Lord, what has happened to me? It seemed like I had it all going. What happened? You hold to God's unchanging hand. You've had the story of the father and the daughter that were traveling home after a revival meeting. And as they began to drive, I'm winding off, as they began to drive, they went through a storm. And as they got through the storm, being a young girl, she got frightened. She said, Daddy, I need to pull over. The father said to her, No, honey, you keep moving. Don't stop. You keep moving. You keep driving. The little that you see, you keep moving. You might not see the end, but keep moving. And as they began to drive and carry on, the big 18 wheelers, the big trucks began to pull over. She says, Daddy, the trucks are pulling over. I'm scared. He says, You keep driving. Keep moving. Don't stop. Keep moving. And she keeps going, she's driving, she keeps going, she's driving. Somebody else stops. Daddy, can I pull over? You keep moving. The storm may be difficult. The storm may be tough. You may not see the end from the beginning. But God, who is the author and finisher of your life, knows the beginning from the end. And He's faithful to take you right through to the end. She kept holding on and she began to drive. And before long, it started getting brighter. And before she knew it, she was out of the storm. And then she'd seen the sun, it's so bright. She looks at her dad with such a smile. She looks back. Her dad looks back. And what do they see? All these trucks all parked off funny. And they, but what's happening? They're all still stuck in the storm. Now she's out of the storm. It takes determination. I'm not talking about works. But if we love God, we're going to manifest it by what we do. There's a certain part that we have to play. And we're going to go through rough times. But through those rough times, we've got to be Christians. We've got to be true children of God. Have faith. Have determination. Have the right attitude. Right mental attitude. The scripture says the right mental attitude towards any of God's promises will make it come to pass. Amen. God will lead us right through. Our sisters once sang a song. The lyrics of the song, Ride Out Your Storm. I'll read it tonight. It says you've been in a storm. And it seems like forever. Your nights of confusion have been far too long. Your sheep has lost anchor. And the storm got you drifting. Just hold on to Jesus and ride out your storm. What storm are you in tonight? Someone might be saying, Brother Enoch, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through. Probably somebody in streaming land trying to listen to this sermon. But you're busy trying to compare yourself with somebody. Preach, knock, knock, on your phone. But yet God is speaking to you. He says, ride out your storm. God is there with you. You may not feel Him, but you're not alone. You're hurting now, but your morning is coming. Just hold on to Jesus and ride out your storm. He says, remember His promise. He said He'll never forsake you. Through the troubled waters, they'll do you no harm. Don't give up the battle, for your answer is coming. Just hold on to Jesus, 
and ride out your storm. Isn't that your prayer tonight? Say, Lord, help me to ride out the storm. No matter what the trials that I'm going through, help me to look to the finish line. Every true hero, every son and daughter of God that have ever amounted to anything have had that on their mind, have looked to the finish line. They did what they could do. They did what was right. They fought a good fight, like Paul said. I fought a good fight. It wasn't easy for Paul. He went through difficult times. Look at him in prison. If you begin to go and research, you'll find out those were not conditions that any human being can live in. And the prophet begins to tell us that the only place that will be justified or fit for us to live in is in the millennium. Look all around you. Look at the gross darkness. Look at what's happening. Look at the laws that's coming into place. You probably won't even be able to preach like we're supposed to. The God of this evil age is satisfying the people to make sure that they feel happy with the religion, but without an experience. Say, Lord, help me to have that experience, to look unto you, to look to the author and finisher of my life. And I believe that God will help us and bring us to where we ought to be. Don't you love him tonight? Let us rise up to our feet. I apologize for taking you so long. I could hardly see that clock in the back. But may the Lord undertake for us. May He help us. May He lead us. May He cause His face to shine upon us in such a trying time. Say, Lord, help me never to live or play the comparison game. Help me to be satisfied with who You've made me. Help me to look to the promise, the promise that You've set for me. One of these days we'll stand to account for what we've done with what God has allotted unto us and what He has given unto us. May we be ready and faithful on that day. And let God undertake for us. We cannot do it on our own. But I believe with Him all things are possible. With Him we can make it. With Him we can ride through this storm. We're not alone. He's there with us. He will lead us just like He led the children of Israel. Just like he did with the Joseph of old, through the trials that he went through, he looked to the finish line. God brought him up to where he was supposed to be. And I believe that God is bringing us to where we ought to be. And Colossians 2 tells us that for in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And verse 10 says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in Him. You are not complete in somebody else. You are complete in Him. May God help us to change our focus. Not to an organization. Not to a church. Not to my denomination. Not to my ideas. But to Him. Now unto Him who is able to keep us from falling. And to let us stand in His presence. Grateful and with great joy. To the only God our Father. Through Jesus Christ the King. May glory and honor be given unto Him. And may we be faithful till the day He returns. God help us to love one another, respect one another, keep us speaking right, speak good about one another. Let's talk good about one another. Whenever the enemy tries to come and twist us, say, Lord, help us, bring us to where we ought to be. If you know of your brother that has gone astray, don't sit there and criticize. Pray for them. Pray for them and say, Lord, help them to run their race. Let them come to where they need to be. Strengthen them. And for him that thinks he's standard, watch out. God help us remain faithful. Let's sing that song, Don't Lose Your Vision of Jesus. Keep your eyes ever on him. Let us keep our eyes on him. Don't desire to just be affiliated with somebody. Sometimes we feel good. I'm affiliated with Pastor So and So. Pastor so and so is my friend and brother so and so is my friend it won't take us into heaven it's not going to amount to anything Just getting to the finish line is what will amount to something let's sing that prayerfully tonight say Lord help us if you've been wayfaring say Lord bring me back 
Brother Branham, in the message, God of this evil age, he begins to talk how they have substituted everything for some theology, for some good explanation. And everybody that seems to have an excuse has got a very good explanation for why they do what they do, for the error that they're in. But say, Lord, I come as I am. No explanations. I just want to be like you. Mold me in your fashion. Draw me close to you. Make me be like, I just want to be like you, not like anybody else. Help me to get right to the finish line. When I cross that line, I want to know that I've run a fair race. Let's sing that together tonight. Amen. says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but to you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Now, the scripture says, Beware of dogs. What is a dog? A dog is something, an animal that goes back to its vomit. And how many times do we associate with ourselves with them that go back to their vomit? God help us tonight. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are of the circumcision which gospel which, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he must trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching of the law, a Philistine, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching of the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. But that, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all these things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them by do, but done, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might turn unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either way already perfect, but I will I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forth for those things which are before me. I press toward the mark of the price of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I believe that's your prayer tonight. I press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads. That's your prayer tonight, wherever you may be. Raise your hand to Him. Say, Lord, help me. I don't want to lose the vision of Jesus. Let me keep my eyes on you. Mold me and make me in your own fashion. Draw me close to you and let me be what you want me to be. 
I'd like to pray for you tonight. And I believe God sees your heart. He's nigh unto a broken and contrived spirit. And He'll gladly give us what we have need of. Let us pray. Our eternal, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your grace. Thank You for making a way for us through the cross. Lord, when You came onto this earth, You were a true manifestation of what You spoke. You told the Pharisees of the day and you said you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up on the third day. That word was manifested. None of what you said ever went out void. But it accomplished that which you meant it for. Lord, we are your children in this last and evil days. You gave a promise in your word and you said you'll have a bride without spot or wrinkle. And Lord, as we live in this evil and terrible day, it reminds me, O oh God, of the time of Noah. Eight souls were saved. The rest rejected your word. And they perished. But those that heard your word were saved. We see the same condition again today. And some may make fun of your word. Some do not want it anymore. Sometimes we become a little bit of oddballs. And it becomes a little uncomfortable for us to carry on. Sometimes we begin to compare ourselves with the world. Lord, won't you grant us grace tonight? Father, with the joy of your words and folding words that you've given unto us, Father, may we open our hearts to accept it. May we see the manifestation of that same word through our lives. Won't you help us tonight, Lord? My hand is raised up tonight. I'd love to have a closer walk with you. Lord, let not the storms of life deter us from looking where you want us to be help us to keep our eyes on the finish line help us to run this race with diligence looking in the mirror of God's word and allowing you to mold us in your own fashion that's my desire my prayer tonight let your mercies and let your strength be seen we're not looking up to any man tonight but we're looking unto you Lord you are the great creator these are your children Lord won't you bless them won't you undertake for them, Lord? Won't you grant to them the desires of, you, of their hearts, Lord? Lord, fulfilling your word to them. Granting to them everything that they have need of. Some have battled sickness for years. Some have battled, Lord, such hard relationships. Husbands that don't understand. Husbands that are so filled and anointed by the devil. Some the other way around. Some children born in funny families. But Lord Jesus, you make all things right. Won't you undertake tonight, Lord? Help your children right across wherever they may be streaming, Lord. Here tonight, Lord, you see hands raised up all over. Won't you undertake for them, Father? May your mercies and strength be seen, Lord. Help us to press on to the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the ministry that you've given to us. Help us to be faithful. We thank you for what you're doing for us. Pray that you help us to continue on in faith. Lord Jesus, for we know without faith we can never please you. And all that walked right with you, walked in faith and give us the strength tonight that your name will be blessed and glorified we ask these things believing in Christ's precious name Amen sing this song one more time you tonight. May you give you strength. And I believe the Lord will undertake for us. He forgives our sins. He went to the cross for that. And if we can just recognize the work that he did on the cross of Calvary, we'll be a different people. It's just us recognizing that. A right mental attitude. Recognition. Cognition of who he is. Spiritual understanding is what God wants us to be. You look and you see your identity 
and you realize that you come from eternity. May the Lord richly bless you. Brother Roger, if I could ask you to come and close for us tonight in the word of prayer. Oh, my brother. Remember our next service. We'll be back at the campgrounds, God willing. Amen. Let us bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, for reminding us not to lose sight of the finish line, which is Thee, O oh God. Is there anything else that we can do, Lord Heavenly Father, without Thee and succeed? There is nothing that we can do, O oh God. We only trust in Thee and Thee alone. May You, Lord, our God Almighty, continue to speak unto us, to raise our faith and make us believe each and every word, O oh God. And, O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, the only thing that we want is Thee and Thee alone. Lord Jesus, we are thankful, O oh God, that You have given us another opportunity to feast, O oh God. And we are thankful, Lord, Heavenly Father, that you love us so much that we can never tell. Our words cannot explain thee, O oh God, the love that you have for us. We are thankful, O oh Lord. May you bless each and every one that has come, even those on the streaming land. May you also bless, O oh God Almighty, the bride of Christ around the world. And your word, O oh Lord Heavenly Father, is said, there will be a bride. And Lord, Lord God Almighty, we are thankful for that. The devil may try to, to thwart us from achieving what we want to achieve. But Lord, the anchor holds, and it is thee, Lord Jesus. God, we thank you, and we thank you, Lord Heavenly Father. For, and may you bless each and every one as they will be going to their respective places, O oh God Almighty. May you guide them, protect them, remind them of thee, O oh God Almighty, in their houses. We pray, Lord, in the name of the Lord and Savior for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God richly bless you. Mm -hmm.